Welcome, welcome, everybody. My name is Jumana Versace, and I'm an anchor from CNBC, and I'll be leading the panel. A uh, really nice end to the video there. The fact that you are listening today means that you are willing to make a change. So what a better way to kick off our panel today about putting the S in ESG. Uh, I think most of the times when we talk about ESG, most people often have the tendency of falling into the trap of just assuming that we're talking about the E, the environmental impact a company has, uh, the climate transition, energy transition uh, that many of these companies are undertaking, often neglecting the S and the G part. Today, obviously, our focus is going to be on the S. So let's talk about the definition and what that broadly means. In a general term, you know, the S is a company's contribution to society, the impact that it has on communities. That could include customer satisfaction, it could include data protection, gender and diversity, employee engagement, human rights, and labor standards. These may include initiatives that encourage diversity, equity, and inclusion, and also address pay gaps as well. In summary, the S is how to create shared value for all. And the interesting thing about this is that investors are beginning to take notice. Um, Edelman's 2020 Institutional Investor Trust Report shows that the S in ESG is now the most important ESG priority for U.S. investors. And with that, I also just want to bring you some news out of the World Economic Forum, um, just on the number of companies supporting the Stakeholder Capitalism Metrics Initiative. And, and this is a big part of our discussion today because um, oftentimes people talk about the challenges of actually building a framework to capture how much good a company is doing and what their overall contribution is to society. So the fact that we're seeing more and more companies sign up to these metrics is very, very encouraging indeed. Since January 2020, over 100 companies have shown support for the initiative, with 50 already including the metrics in their 2021-2020. Uh, 2020 2021 reporting materials and an initial analysis of the first reports shows that companies have spent over 1.5 trillion dollars in training over 20 trillion dollars on r d 23 trillion dollars in cumulative multi-year innovation investments and that these companies are contributing to their communities and social vitality with nearly 140 trillion dollars in taxes so at the end of the day, we are beginning to see a convergence between the public and the private sector. So it is very encouraging. Uh, one point of housekeeping, we're going to have about a 30 minute panel discussion and then afterwards we're going to open it up to Q&A. So we encourage anyone watching to submit their questions. You can do that uh, via the Slido link um, and I, sh I believe that should be available in the chat. So we'll be screening out for any questions that come through. Now, in terms of our panelists, I just want to introduce them all quickly, uh, starting with Philippe Bayon, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Ecopetrol in Colombia, the largest oil and gas conglomerate in Colombia. Uh, Judith Weiss, who is the Chief People and Sustainability Officer and member of the Managing Board at Siemens in Germany. Ruth Harper, who is the Chief Communications and Sustainability Officer at Manpower Group in the U.S. And then Judy, not to be confused with Judith, Judy Kaseski, Chief Executive of Sancroft here in the UK. Sancroft is a London-based international sustainability consultancy company. So I'm going to kick things off. Um, Felipe, I'm going to actually start with you. Um, Ecopatrol is one of the first, if not the first, company in the Latin region to commit to the stakeholder capitalism metrics. So obviously those encompass all parts of ESG. But today, the focus of our panel is obviously on the S. And given you are an energy company, the CEO of an energy company, I just want to put the question to you. Why is the S? Why is the social impact and uh, the, the social contribution of an oil and energy company so important to you right now? Jumana, thanks, and good to see everyone, and thanks for the opportunity. So uh, as we think about Ecopetrol, that's just celebrating its first 70 years, and we're looking for the next 10, 20, 30 years, we're a company that operates in uh, 
probably more than a third of the municipalities in, in country were neighbors of those municipalities. We actually live and breathe and go to school and uh, purchase goods and, uh, and actually um, are in coexistence in those areas. So it's fundamental that we, if we can actually provide uh, benefits to what we do in purchases of, uh, of goods or good employment uh, and uh, good conditions. And you were mentioning things like human rights and how do we approach our relationship with our stakeholders is fundamental that the S is part of what we do. As we think about the next 20, 30 years, we announced uh, actually a month ago that we just bought the largest energy transmission company in Latin America. And that's to ensure that we can provide electricity to people. We do believe that providing energy to, uh, to the communities is one of the stronger ways and more powerful ways to close the gaps. COVID has shown us that we are very, very fragile as human beings, and it has accelerated things like decarbonization and electrification. And the S, and I'll stop with this one, there's something in Colombia called uh, uh, like doing construction work or doing projects in lieu of taxes. So we can actually do investments in water or social or education instead of paying taxes to the government. So once the school is up and running, we can go and deduct that from our taxes. And recently, one um, single mom was saying, thanks for bringing a, a school supplies to our kids, because you've taken one of the uh, uh, key elements of violence out of the equation. And I said, I don't understand. And you said, look, when there's 600 kids, 600 kids fighting for 50 desks, the desks become an issue of violence a violence generator. So we have the ability, I think, to touch many. We don't want to replace government. We're a company most largely owned by, um, by government, but we are floated in the New York Stock Exchange. So it brings us the possibility of being very nimble. But again, as I think it's a fundamental part of how we see ourselves uh, in our day-to-day -day operations and long-term. And it's really interesting what you say there about the importance of the co collaboration between the public and private sector and the uh, incentives the government has put in place to that effect. Uh, Ruth, I'd like to turn to you um, because Manpower have also released 2020 reporting materials that include stakeholder capitalism metrics. And in your 2021 ESG report, you outlined the firm's S commitments. And one of them is, quote, becoming creators of talent at scale to help improve employability and prosperity for all. Tell us more about that. Thanks, Joanna. Thank you. Thank you to you. Thank you to the forum for having Manpower Group here today. We're thrilled to be. It's great to hear the good news as well around the kind of um, collective, if you like, of more and more organizations um, signing up to this stakeholder capitalist metrics as we have. We released our report um, a couple of months ago now, Jamana, um, our Working to Change the World plan, uh, with a little bit of the kind of looking back at our 2020 data and even more of kind of looking forward with some of our kind of ambitious goals around the future. And just as a bit of context, as Felipe just gave around um, his organization, we're a global organization we put people into work. We're driven by our purpose um, to find meaningful, sustainable employment because we believe it can change the world, the impact that that has on individuals and on communities. We do believe it has the power to change the world. And as part of that, and as part of the kind of shift um, in terms of even pre-pandemic, um, the shift of digitization and the acceleration of investment in technology by, by all sectors, not just the technology sector, means we've seen a kind of skills revolution beginning to take place over a number of years. And as we look ahead, we understand the relevance uh, and the necessity for organizations, including our own, um, to help people increase their employability and be resilient and prepared for today's world of work, as well as the future world of work as that changes. So that's why we focus on being creators of talent and creators of talent at scale across the 75 countries in which we operate and the thousands of clients that we find 
talent people for um, so that we can work in partnership to be able to make an impact on an individual basis, but of course also on a community and uh, global basis too. So that's a little bit of an explanation around the creators of talent and our, our lofty goal there. And of course our, our um, ambitions include some of the other areas that you talked around earlier in terms of diversity and equity and inclusion, um, uh, as, as well as being creators of talent. Well, it's interesting because just with these first two questions, uh, we've got two different perspectives of what the S means. The first one uh, was to do with a company's impact on the close community and municipalities. Your response was about skills preparedness for the workplace. Um, I want to put the next question to Judith um, from Siemens. Um, on the Siemens Capital Market Day, you also launched a new SGF-focused initiative called Degree, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but uh, I believe that a big part of that is um, driving diversity and how a diverse workforce can bring about, bring about better economic outcomes. So we've touched on skills, we've touched on the impact on community. Let's talk a little bit about the importance of diversity in the workplace as well. We're a, we're a technology company that has been around for 175 years and, uh, and we want to build technology with purpose that really changes the lives um, for, for people and societies around the world. We change industrial operations, uh, the future of mobility, healthcare and, uh, and grid infrastructure and building infrastructure. And for us, the degree framework really sets out um, our ambition both from an environmental, um, a social and a governance perspective and uh, interestingly enough, so I was, it was a great listening to Ruth just now. One of our E's is employability for all the reasons that Ruth has just outlined. But equity as in diversity, equity and inclusion is indeed also one. Because we believe that... Um, if, uh, if we find a way of bringing prosperity and equal chances uh, to everybody, if we have everybody participate in the workforce, around the planet, um, will we uh, be able to offer the technology we want to be able to offer for, an, for another 175 years because we need um, a diverse and inclusive workshop to be, um, workforce to be innovative. But like Ruth, we also believe um, that prosperity and social peace is very much linked to whether people are actually in employment. Uh, we believe in the, in the value of work in and of itself for the individual, but also for societies. Okay, great. Um, so that leads me to uh, Judy um, from Sancroft. And now your company advises corporates on their sustainability strategies. I'm just interested in hearing how people's thinking has evolved um, over, you know, the, say the past decade or so. Obviously, there's been a major development in that space, but also over the course of the pandemic, we briefly touched on that. Um, how has ESG come to the forefront with the clients that you speak to? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, and first of all, I'm, I'm so pleased to be here. Um, and um, the, uh, I mean, I think what we saw in the pandemic almost immediately uh, after, the, after the pandemic uh, struck was a, a real change in recognition of the value of the S in ESG. To some extent, what this reflected was the fact that, you know, business leaders had kind of, you know, they'd known before the, before the pandemic the value of a, uh, an engaged, vital, healthy workforce, the value of a, a strong, wider society that's able to actually buy their products, buy their services, participate in the wider economy and so forth. But the fact that the, that the pandemic struck meant that they could no longer kind of ignore or assume that these were sort of far off, distant, maybe future kind of impacts to, to deal with, but something that's here and now, and that's, that's hugely relevant to the, uh, to, to the, to the way that, uh, uh, that, that, that businesses have to be prepared to work today in order to uh, make these steps beyond the pandemic and into, and into a kind of more resilient, more sustainable future. So we really saw right from the very beginning of the pandemic, a recognition that this was a moment to stop doing 
old behaviors, things that didn't that didn't work anymore, that were suited to an old fashioned kind of um, marketplace or um, neighborhood or uh, style of working. And really um, take the opportunity of a crisis like this to reinvent the way that, that you relate to your employees, to your customers, to your other stakeholders. Mm. Well, I mean, you could also argue if I took the opposite approach um, that it has in many ways, the pandemic set back a lot of these initiatives, um, particularly when it comes to employment. And we know now looking at the statistics that women were disproportionately hit. Um, yeah. Ruth, I actually just want to pick up this question with you and whether you feel that in, in a sense, the pandemic has set back the diversity agenda just because um, you know women and, and people of minority have unfortunately been disproportionately hit when it comes to unemployment. I think that's a really important point to flag, Jumana, because I think in a lot of the, you know, through 2020 into 2021, We've talked about the acceleration of many trends, the acceleration of remote working, the acceleration of digitization and the use of technology. And it's kind of acceleration of so many trends. And I think it's really important for us and for the forum as they are to be reinforcing that some trends have hit the brakes and have gone into speedy reverse. And I think that kind of um, progress that we've made around gender parity um, and to your point around um, addressing marginalized um, communities and ensuring that we can equip them to be successful in the labour market um, has been um, halted to a certain extent, as we can see the data telling us that women have fallen out of the labour market um, across across the globe. People of colour are more disadvantaged. You know, I think one of, one of the other, um, so that's an alarm bell for us. You know, how do we look look at our policies and our return policies especially to ensure that we can be very conscious and very intentional about how we ensure communities and people of colour, women, are not um, left out of the return to the workplace. And I think the other thing worth flagging too is let's not forget we talk about remote working and we talk about the challenges of balancing hybrid is a return. About 60% of the workforce never left the workplace. They soldiered on, they continued going into the workplace. What are we doing too to ensure they also benefit um, from this kind of new way of working or this new return, return to a new normal um, as, as we talk about, what does that look like for that majority of the workforce too? How do we ensure shift patterns that are working for women, whether we're cutting shift patterns so that they're four, four and a half hours rather than nine hours? You know, how are we ensuring we're doing everything we can in that regard to ensure that you know, the labour market is, a, is as accessible as it can be for as many, when at the same time the data is also telling us talent shortages and hiring intentions are at their highest mm -hmm. um, for decades or longer. Uh, so a lot to be done, I think, in terms of that kind of on-the-ground active um, addressing of, of the trends that we've, we can begin to see are emerging too. Judith, would you like to weigh in on this topic as well, just how the pandemic promoted or set back some of the ESG initiatives we talk about? And I think what we, what we see is, um, is, is very different uh, in different geographies and, and in different industries, obviously. I mean, Siemens was, was lucky enough to extremely well through the crisis. And like Ruth said, uh, we, we kept our manufacturing plants open. Uh, we kept our technicians out there, um, but we, we left everybody else at home. I think that there have been upsides to this as well. So undoubtedly, Ruth has, has pointed out some of the real watchouts that we need to take very seriously seriously, but I do think that there are upsides as well. So in, in Siemens, for instance, we said we, we will give people two to three days in the future to work from, from anywhere where they feel that they can be most productive um, within the remit, of course, of, of what the, the nature of their work is. So therefore, that, that level of flexibility will need to be explored by job profiles and, and by job context. And that's exactly the message that we've been given. We, ha we had to trust people and we wanted to trust people through the pandemic. What, what can we do to bring that forward and really give people maximum uh, autonomy in how they want to work, um, again, within the remit of, of the work itself? Um, we've had some, some level playing field by everybody being virtual. 
it didn't matter so much whether whether you were at home um, and where exactly you were and whether you were close to the head office or somewhere in a, in a remote location. Also, that kind of power distance didn't play a role anymore. So in terms of inclusiveness of visibility, I think there's also been some very positives in this crisis. And we want to make sure that we carry that forward in, in the best possible way. I want to turn to a, a slightly different topic, but also um, extremely relevant in the context of an ESG discussion, also in the context of the S part of ESG, and that is uh, just the metrics we use to evaluate whether a company is meeting their targets. Felipe, I'd like to put this question to you. Um, you know, when you talk about, say, your financial targets, they're, they're quantifiable. You can put them out there. They're easily assessed. Um, there are global disclosures that you are required to abide by, not so much the case for ESG and definitely not the case for the S part of ESG. How do you go about navigating the complexities of building a framework that allows you to assess your overall impact on communities? So I'd say, Jumana, the first thing is that uh, ESG is part of our core values, as we've talked about our uh, values declaration. So it's it's very important. And I'll start with something that's um, E, S, and G are ult ultimately all linked together. For, for example, from a governance point of view, 55% of our variable compensation for everyone, 14,000 employees, is linked to T, E, S, G targets. So it's real. It makes sense. So we need to measure it. It's things like reduction in CO2 emissions, reuse of water, circular economy. We've uh, announced recently that we're creating, we, have, we are creating in Colombia 50 acres. Those are lands that we use for exploration or hide in reserve. They're gonna be dedicated, for example, compensate CO2 emissions. So there's lots of things that we're, we're gonna be doing. And in those numbers, we also measure things like, for example, we have 690 people with disabilities in the companies. How, how do we care for them or minorities or uh, sexual orientation, or in things of, of gender, for example, a very short story. Three years ago, I went to Davos and I came back. My son said, so what did you learn, dad? And I said, oh, fourth industrial revolution and this, that, and the other, and gender equity. And he said, and what is that? That for the same job with the same conditions and same responsibilities, men and women should at least earn the same. Mm -hmm. And he said, can you guarantee that at Ecopetrol? And I said, that's the toughest question that has been asked to me. And I said, not then, but now I can. So we actually measure things. So SEM, I think it's a great platform. We've started, it's gonna be a journey. We've, um, I think we've reported on 45 of the 55 metrics, the core and expanded metrics. We've also uh, reported our first TCFD this year, SASB. And one of the things that eventually will happen is that all of these platforms will need to converge at some stage because there's too much data, too, too much information. I think as, as industry, as leaders, we need to work in that space, but transparency is fundamental. It's a journey. People want out there, investors, you know, they want to know what we're talking about. And last point, we've actually started using something we call TESG, which is Technology, Environmental, Social, and Governance. In Spanish, it's called sostenibilidad. It's putting technology at the heart of sustainability. It's appealing to the younger generations and technology can actually accelerate as becoming more sustainable. So it's a fundamental part of how we run our business. Mm, the interplay with the technology and digitization is obviously very key here. Um, Judy, I wanna to turn to you because um, I, I believe you have some good expertise in this space. You are chair of the Global Sustainability Standards Board. Absolutely. That is an independent body created by the GRI with responsibility for setting globally accepted sustainability reporting standards. So um, you're very well placed to talk about this topic. Um, I mean, how would you say we've progressed in terms of developing standardization in this space? Yeah, so especially with respect to the social uh, dimensions, there, there is historically there it has been a it has been a, a tougher challenge to uh, to come up with standardized measurements for uh, social impact. 
and this is really this is where the GRI is focused on is on the environmental, social, economic impacts that enterprises have, um, which may have financial materiality attached to them or not. But the concern is really about impact on people, um, and and in that and in that respect, it is quite difficult to, uh, to to come up with standardized measures. But we have made quite a lot of progress in in many respects. Some of the challenges have to do with the fact that, especially in the social category. Um, the idea that you could just report some metrics, some measurements without context, they just will not mean anything. They have to be put in context of the, um, the overall nature of the issue, where it arises, how does it attach to the, um, the, the, the uh, organization's activities, um, and what's the organization doing to manage those, those impacts. These are the these are the things that have to be comprehended, you know, more broadly in order to uh, give um, substance to to those to those measurements. Um, without that context, it just it just won't uh, it just won't work. Um, the other thing that I I would say that is 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 sort of challenging about it is that very often in the social sphere. What you what you end up um, measuring and what you end up actually working on internally through management has you um, has has the has the result of avoiding impacts, right? So it's very hard to actually report on how many accidents were avoided because of something that you did, how many human rights violations didn't take place because your business had the right kind of approach to it. That is um, uh, unfortunately. It's not the sort of thing that that uh, an individual enterprise can really take credit for, but those but those processes are really part and parcel of the response to the to the issues. Um, the way that this has evolved over the years, I will take the example of occupational health and safety, which is one of the most important social impacts for all organizations. It has evolved very. Um, uh, sophisticated measures in, in recent years um, that really help uh, companies to talk about the cultural aspects of um, safety awareness and of situational awareness, um, which are required to uh, prevent the um, the outcome, the negative outcome of, of, of accidents and injuries and so forth. And, and it's, it's really about expanding that uh, kind of lens on, on some of these that I think is the, the next frontier uh, for, for, for all of these. Um, I will just say briefly that there is significant consensus among a lot of the organizations that are involved in the um, uh, in the development of, of sustainability reporting uh, standards and protocols, including WEF, including GRI and, and SASB and, and others around the uh, the general categories. There are um, regional differences in the way that certain things may be calculated, but globally there is a great deal of consensus on some of the most important uh, issues and impacts ranging from diversity to occupational health and safety to um, labor conditions and, and, uh, and so forth, um, and uh, product responsibility and, and, and many other uh, issues like that. We are seeing um, a, a, a narrowing of scope, but a, 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 um, an expansion of the depth of reporting that uh, companies are providing in response to this. So in some respects, it may look like more information is being provided and, and for that matter requested than has been in the past. But I would argue that it's a question of depth rather than breadth that we're seeing the growth in. Well, oftentimes when we talk about ESG, uh, that also entails a lot of investments. And so companies are, are faced with almost like a trade-off between the short term, the medium term, and the long term. Uh, Judith, a, a question to you on what um, investment in ESG does to overall portfolio returns and to just general economic returns um, on, on the broader community, broader society. I mean, have you conducted research showing that it will pay off for your company to do well in society? 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's always um, hard to, to quantify these uh, things with exact science, but we have developed um, since 2015 an approach which we call business to society, by which we're trying to do exactly that. We're trying to measure the impact our portfolio has had on society. So we, we know, for instance, that through the use of our portfolio, our customers last year saved about 150 million metric tons of CO2. We know that we contributed to, to around about 280 billion GDP growth around the world. We know that we impact around about 5 million jobs around the world on top of the 200 190,000 uh, that are that are Siemens employees. So we have got methodology, accredited methodology, by which we're trying to do exactly that. Um, and we think, and therefore I like Philippe's point about adding technology into the equation very much. Uh, I think in our case, it's the technology that really can make a huge difference going forward. So therefore doing something that helps the planet um, and will ultimately also have impact on people for us is actually really good business. We're not one, luckily, we're not one of the industries um, that, uh, that have a huge carbon footprint themselves. So therefore it's really about how do we apply technology, digitalization in particular, uh, to make sure that we help with some of the work world's biggest challenges um, and, uh, and and make an impact. And if you allow me, I'll give a, I'll give a last short example. We recently signed a contract uh, with Egypt um, to implement uh, the very first electrified rail system that connects um, uh, the Mediterranean Sea and the Red Sea. And we will have decarbonized transport um, for, for 34 million Egyptians, but we will also be creating another 15,000 jobs to which we will deliver some of the upskilling and reskilling. And we know with infrastructure comes also GDP growth. So those are examples of where for us, it's actually a lovely equation of, of how we can uh, see good business for us, but, but really business with impact. Mm -hmm. uh, Felipe, I'd, I'd like to put the question to you as well, because uh, I know that Eco Patrol have recently taken some controlling stakes in more sustainable companies. Clearly, ESG is a big priority of your firm. You've mentioned that over the last uh, half an hour or so. Uh, but how do your investors feel about this? How do the holders of the company feel about an oil and energy company, the largest one in Colombia, undergoing this transition? Obviously, that's going to entail a complete overhaul of your financials over the short term. So I think the first thing, uh, and I'll, I'll share something with you, we, we only have 270,000 shareholders, so it's not a very large number, but some of them are the pension funds in country. So through them, we're actually touching 17 million Colombians every day. So we, we actually touch lots of people, and I was mentioning that we bought the largest energy transmission company in Latin America as well. So we've just expanded and have a broader uh, sort of footprint right now. The, the first thing I think we need to be very clear that we need to protect our core business. So how through processes, safety, ethical performance, and uh, efficient performance, we keep on generating uh, the revenues, the taxes, the royalties, the dividends that can support some of the programs that are required to close the gaps. And that's, uh, I think, the first thing. At the end of the day, how do we avoid stranded assets? Pandemic has thrown us backwards five or 10 years in terms of development. We're part of the backbone of that development going forward. So the, se the second thing is we need to diversify our business. So we're working with, for example, Siemens, you know, in, in things like uh, assessing hydrogen potential. And how do we look at the next 10, 15 years becoming a gasier company and the electrification side of things that I mentioned through the ESA acquisition. How do we decarbonize? And I think that the fourth pillar on that transition is TESG, technology, environmental, social, and government. So I think it's very uh, being very upfront with our investors and showing what we're doing. At the end of the day, we need to run a business that's profitable, but that's sustainable as well. So people need to understand that the transition needs to be orderly. It will take some time. We can just not flip the switch, you know? It won't happen like that. But I think time, the clock has accelerated on us and in general on industry and the leaders. We need to step up to the plate, you know, and we need to, uh, to be more out there, listen to people, back to your introduction on this, on this section. So I think shareholders like it, but they also are expecting the returns from us.
Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it's not all just about punishing the worst offenders. You've got to reward the people who are trying to find solutions. Um, so I'm going to leave the panel part of the discussion there. We are getting a lot of questions. Uh, one of them is about technology, and I think uh, both uh, Felipe and Judith addressed this. How is technology helping to drive the delivery of the company's ability to drive positive impacts of the S? We talked about TESG, so I think um, we kind of hit on that one. But uh, I have a question for Ruth that I think would be um, uh, very relevant uh, to manpower. Uh, what has employee and workforce response been to companies implementing ESG efforts and how much have they been a driving force? Gosh, that's a great question because we haven't talked a great deal. We've done a mention of our stakeholders and we've talked about investors. I think more importantly, especially through the pandemic, the, you know, the realization of how organizations also need to be concerned about the well-being and the views of all of their stakeholders, especially their employees, has risen right to the top of the ta right to the top of the agenda. Um, and you know, a, a short story from our perspective, we we've. Um, talked about and we've acted on three key sustainability pillars as part of our sustainability plan over the last decade or so, getting people ready for work, um, upskilling people once they're in the workforce, and um, a focus on integration and inclusion. And just um, in the last couple of years, we added climate action to our sustainability pillars. Um, as a professional services firm, we haven't seen ourselves um, as a huge contributor to to, um, again, to, to um, Judith's point, you know, to the carbon footprint. But um, we realize how important that is to our employees as much as it is to our wider stakeholders. And the kind of ricochet of excitement, if you like, when we added that to our priorities, aligned to our business priorities, um, was even quite surprising to us um, as well. So I think that kind of listening to your employees um, and reflecting that your business strategy um, needs to be so clearly connected with your ESG strategy to be sustainable and to be credible um, is as important to uh, internally as it is to um, the external audience too. Well, you raise a really uh, very valid point, which is that you need buy-in from your employees. So that gives me a nice segue to the next question, which I'd like to give to Judy. Um, based on, on, on the companies that you've spoken to, what are some examples uh, for educating and motivating employees to be connected to their organization's purpose and ESG strategy? And what role does leadership play in this internal engagement? In other words, uh, how do you mobilize uh, the employees of the firm to believe in the company's overall ESG strategy? Yeah, well, uh, great question. I, in, in, in our experience, I would say most of the time employees need little help being motivated in, in this direction. There's already so much employee um, keenness and um, enthusiasm for um, a strong social purpose, uh, for a business that is, um, you know, um, uh, genuine and authentic in its sustainability strategy and in its contribution to the world. Everybody wants to work for a business like that. And if, if that's what you've got, then I'm sure you will already find um, employees um, extremely uh, keen to be involved in it. I think one of the, 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 the um, keys to unlocking this is to ensure that your strategy is actually recognizable to the people who work for the business, you know, the, that it reflects the day-to-day -day reality. Um, it reflects what they know from the inside of, of the business, the way that you actually work, the way that they know that they are um, um, pressed or incentivized on a day-to-day -day basis to prioritize things, to make their voices heard, to add their, um, their ideas uh, into the, um, the, the, the sort of strategy development if you can make that authentic for today's employees, then they will be real ambassadors for your sustainability strategy, for your ESG reputation, uh, for your relationships with, with your stakeholders. And I, and I simply think that it's a matter of finding the opportunities to engage those employees 
in the places that are relevant to, to their jobs um, uh, and, um, and letting them see the impact of that engagement reflected in your externally facing ESG strategies and your um, messages to the market um, uh, going forward as a result of that. Um, another question that, uh, well, I don't want to put anyone in particular on the spot, but since Felipe actually touched on this earlier, I'm going to start with you. But how are companies thinking about linking ESG performance to compensation? I believe you briefly touched on that earlier. Well, I, I, I mentioned it, and I, uh, sorry, I, I, I'll be brief. So a couple years ago, 25% of our compensation, variable compensation, was linked to ESG metrics. Today is 55%. So this is actually taking the board, the senior management, and 14,000 direct employees and saying, look, this is what we want to do. And again, it's things like, how do we use less water in our businesses? So it impacts communities. It, it impacts agricultural activity. How do we actually go about uh, our eco-reserve program? How do we reduce emissions? How do we put more renewable energy into our own uh, consumption and operation. So it's something that it's, uh, it can be very hard, uh, measured with hard data, and it touches everybody. So it's, it's a direct link, you know, and uh, it, when, and I'll be blunt, when you touch people's uh, pockets, they actually feel it, you know, and, and there's uh, alignment between compensation, direction, and at the end of the day, uh, and I like uh, Judy saying, uh, there's very little things that you need to do to motivate people. People want to do the right thing, but this is just ensuring that there's consistency from the board to uh, each and every operator in the in the field. All right, I've got time for one last question that I'm going to squeeze in and pose to Judith. I would be interested in hearing how the corporates have partnered with their supply chain and other partners to drive change. Um, very interesting to hear the Siemens perspective. Yeah, I mean, we have a we have a very broad uh, supplier base, and today we work um, already with uh, probably around sixty five thousand suppliers on things like um, business code of conduct, supplier code of conduct, uh, human rights, but increasingly also on topics um, like carbon web assessment. So suppliers are an important part for us uh, from an ecological perspective. Our footprint into the supplier base is probably a tenfold to what our own is. So therefore, it's really important for us um, that we are aligned in terms of objectives uh, with our suppliers. Um, and we've probably started that, uh, that journey, particularly on carbon web assessment, two or three years ago. Excellent. Well, uh, with that, I think we're going to round up the discussion. Uh, I've got to thank all four of you. This was uh, really interesting, and I feel we could have talked for hours. There's so many more elements we could have discussed. Um, but thank you, Felipe, Judy, Judith, and Ruth. Thank you for your time today. And for anyone who is watching, feel free to comment on social media or on top link about some of your impressions from this panel. It is a topic that is of course, not going away anytime soon. It is only going to get more relevant in terms of how we think about markets and how companies think about their footprint on the environment and on communities. So uh, with that, I'd like to wrap things up. Uh, thank you very much for the World Economic Forum for hosting this panel. Thanks everyone. <laughs>